Uh, once again, good evening, everybody. My name is Trisha Shimamura, and I'm the Director of Community Affairs for the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Happy Thursday. Uh, I hope that you're here to talk land use and to learn a little bit more about our uh, local governments. If not, then I'm I'm very sorry. Um, uh, but uh, we're here, we're the Manhattan Borough President's Office. The charter uh, in our New York City charter, it says something along the lines that the borough president is responsible, every borough president is, is responsible for, for provi providing technical support and assistance to community boards. We take that uh, responsibility to heart and really try to put together a, a series of trainings and webinars that would not only apply to community board members, but also if you serve on a CEC, if you serve on a tenant association, a bid, a nonprofit organization, or any other way that you are locally serving your neighborhood and your community. Um, and that's how for the second year in a row, row we created the leadership training series, <clears throat> which is supposed to be a uh, kind of very brief uh, deep dives into various topics that again could hopefully give you some some snapshots, some tidbits of of good advice, best practices, resources, um, and a better understanding of of how um, the various systems of local government work, so that you can be a better advocate for your community. That's really how we get to tonight's program, which is all about land use and zoning. And I really want to give a huge shout out to our land use team tonight because you get to see a whole other unit of our office um, and hear from them directly. Um, I want to also give a huge shout out to Porfirio Figueroa, Eric Cuello, and Don Billings from my team, who uh, really have done a tremendous job of putting together this whole series. This is... I think the seventh training that we've done this week, um, all on different topics from parliamentary procedure to conflicts of interest to de-escalation and bystander intervention. <clears throat> and really we are nearing the end here. It's actually the technically the last webinar, full webinar program that we have this evening. Um, tomorrow, which I hope that you would join us for, is going to be our first in-person event, and it's going to be at John Jay College at 12 o'clock. Uh, it's on emergency preparedness. Um, it's great. It's an hour. Once you register and are there, not only are you going to get uh, information about how to be best prepared in um, when facing a, a natural disaster. But as a bonus, um, our friends in the New York State Department of Emergency Management have given us fully stocked go bags that are full with the first aid kit, flashlight, all the stuff that you need in order to be more prepared and to keep prepare your family for any sort of natural disaster that happens. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my voice. Um, so I hope that you join us. I think we'll put, we put the information into the chat uh, so that you can register. We'll be there tomorrow at 12 o'clock. And then I also wanna do a plug because we had so many trainings that we didn't have enough time in one week uh, to put them all in. On Monday in our office at 12 o'clock, we're going to be doing a training with uh, New York State Department or New York City Department of Health, excuse me, on overdose prevention. And if you are able to come in person, it's going to be a hybrid meeting. So you can come virtually and get the information, which is great. I know that many of many folks have already RSVP'd, but if you come in person to our office at One Center Street, you'll also be equipped with uh, doses of Narcan, Narcan after, the, after we learn how to use it. Uh, so that you can also keep that safe in your go bag should an emergency situation come up where you need to use it. So for me, I'm going to go to tomorrow's training at five at 12 o'clock uh, at John Jay College. I'm going to get my go bag. I'm going to get my first aid kit. I'm going to learn a little bit more about natural disasters and, and what to do in, in when facing a, a situation that comes up far too uh, frequently in our city. And then I'm going to, on Monday, get trained on overdose prevention, get my Narcan doses to put into my first aid kit, feel a little more prepared for anything that comes up in the future. And I hope that you'll join us for those two last events. Uh, like I said, tomorrow's is in-person, 12 o'clock, John Jay College, and then Monday's is going to be hybrid, either on Zoom or in-person at our office at One Center Street. Um, I've clearly talked enough uh, for uh, the rest of this week, really. So I'm going to pass it off to uh, Porfirio and to uh, Lizette and our, on our team uh, to do more of an introduction and get into the topic tonight. I just want to say quickly that if you have any questions, the best thing to do is to click on that Q&A button right at the bottom of your screen. You can put your, Q, your question right into that app right there. We'll be able to answer all of the questions that way. 
Also, um, just keeping an eye on the time, we are going to really try to end this as close to 630 as possible. We know that many of you, surprised uh, to no one, have uh, community board meetings and other things going on this tonight. Um, so uh, if you have to leave early, if, you know, work calls, if things come up and you have to leave us a little earlier than expected, we understand that's why you may see on the top left-hand corner of your screen, the recording uh, sign. And that's because all of these trainings are being recorded. We're going to be posting them all on our YouTube page after this week. So we hope that you'll stay with us to the end. We hope that you'll engage with us, ask questions through that Q&A function. But if worse comes to worse and you have to leave, it's okay. You'll be able to find these trainings afterwards uh, on our YouTube page. Um, that's it for me tonight, but I'm going to just say that ask that Porfirio and Eric both put uh, your contact information into the chat so that if you have any other questions, you can always come to us and ask them afterwards. I want to thank Land Use again for putting together the tonight's presentation and for the constant work that you guys are doing in that unit. And um, hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Thank you, Tricia. So my name is Porfirio Figueroa, and I'm the community coordinator for the Manhattan Borough President's Office and also liaison to community boards 11 and 12. And I have the great privilege of introducing our land use team. Lisette Chaparro serves as the director of land use and planning for the Manhattan Borough President, Mark Levine. And in that role, she advises the Borough President on a wide range of planning issues and helps to support all 12 community districts on matters related to land use, zoning, housing, and development. As director, she has advised the BP's office on over 30 ULIP applications. Most recently, Lizette helped produce a Housing Manhattanites, a report that outlined the concrete steps and locations that could provide over 73,000 units of housing throughout the borough of Manhattan. Lizette is the 2023 recipient of the IBO Bolton Community Planning Award from the Citizens Housing Planning Council. And in 2022, she was named in City and States Magazine's 40 Under 40 list. The daughter of immigrants from Colombia and Ecuador, Lisette graduated from Brown University with a BA in Urban Studies and earned an MA in City and Regional Planning from Rutgers University. Madeleine McRory joined the Manhattan Borough President's Office in 2022 a senior urban planner, and prior to the Manhattan Borough President's Office, Madeleine was the senior policy analyst at Trade Organization, where her work focused on housing and land use policies, as well as real estate market reports. Madeleine holds a master's in urban planning from Columbia University and bachelor's degrees in economics and urban studies from Fordham. Celeste Royo is a senior urban planner and has been with the Manhattan Borough President's Office since June. Celeste has previously worked in development and adaptive reuse of historic properties and in parks and public spaces. She holds a master's in city and regional planning from Rutgers University and a bachelor's in urban studies from Vassar College. I present to you, Lisette Chaparro. Thanks, board video. Um, I'll just jump in real quick um, while um, Madeline's pulling up the the presentation to um, just express our thanks for for folks having an interest on um, learning a little bit more about the land use process. Um, as as Trisha mentioned, um, just want to remind folks to um, to use the Q and A function for any questions that that you um, have um, throughout the presentation. Um, Madeline and Celeste are gonna do a great job getting through a, a fair bit of information here. Um, and we will do our best to, to answer the questions within our time this evening. Um, and we'll also make ourselves available for um, any follow-up um, questions um, um, that we may have afterwards. Um, and with that, um, guys, take it away. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming out to Land Use 101 tonight. Uh, so our agenda for this evening, we're going to talk about what is zoning, the New York City development framework, public review process, other planning tools, some challenges, and then we'll finish with some information on landmarks. So starting with the New York City zoning map, as you see here, uh, the zoning map tells us a lot about what's going on around us. Um, it tells us the different zoning districts in the city, which can be residential, commercial, or manufacturing. You can see here, yellow is residential, red is commercial, and purple is manufacturing. 
Uh, and these zoning districts define a variety of different things, including uh, the permitted uses in each area uh, in use groups one through 18, which include residential uses, community facility, retail and service, regional commercial and amusement, waterfront recreation, heavy automotive uses, and industrial uses, basically anything that can happen in the city. Uh, it also defines the density of an area, at, which is the maximum number of dwelling units that can be on a zoning lot, the building envelope, which is the maximum three-dimensional shape a building can take, which is permitted by height, setback, and yard controls, the floor area ratio, or FAR, which is the ratio of total building floor area to the area of its zoning lot, uh, and the special district status. So the New York City zoning resolution is the document that defines all of these zoning and special purpose districts, the use groups, and the detailed bulk density and use regulations, as well as loading and parking regulations, special permit processes, and everything else that defines land use in the city. So sometimes zoning districts can overlap. For example, special districts can overlap with regular zoning districts, business improvement districts, and historic districts. So we see here, all in about the same area. We have the Special East Midtown District on the left. We have landmarks and historic districts in the middle. And we have business improvement districts or bids on the right, which includes Times Square, Fifth Avenue, and Grand Central Partnership. So New York City generally has an as-of-right development framework, meaning that most things get built without needing to go through land use processes or speak a, seek a special permit or approval. Um, this ensures consistent and rational application, it discourages deal making, it allows the market to respond to changes in demand, reduces costs as going through land use processes is expensive, um, but all of these buildings still go through approval with the Department of Buildings, and our office may still track and work on some of these projects, uh, even if we're not mandated to as we are in land use processes. So there's a variety of land use actions that can take place in New York City at the city, state, and federal level. Uh, and these are triggered by different types of developments. So in the city, um, there are ULERPs, which are mandated by the charter. And those include zoning changes, site selection, uh, disposition or acquisition of city-owned land, uh, among many other things. And we will go into much greater detail about ULERPs in a moment. There are zoning text amendments, which are changes to the zoning resolution, uh, which DCP will refer to community boards for review. There are special permits, which are discretionary actions that can be subject, subject to ULERP or the BSA, which is the Board of Standards and Appeals, to modify bulk use or parking regu resolutions. Those can go to the City Planning Commission uh, or the BSA. The BSA also grants variances and decides appeals to determinations made by the Department of Buildings. There are also uh, City Planning Commission or CPC chair authorizations. This is a discretionary action made by the CPC. And this often involves an informal referral to community boards, uh, which allows community board members a chance to weigh in. And it modifies zoning requirements if certain findings have been met. Uh, and these are all outlined in the zoning resolution. For example, in certain manufacturing districts, the CPC can grant authorizations for residential use. Then we have the Landmarks and Preservation Commission, LPC, which grants buildings and sites landmark or historic district status, and then it regulates them after de designation. And then the Public Design Commission, which has jurisdiction over permanent structures, landscape architecture, and art proposed on or over city-owned property. So now there are also various state and federal land use actions. Uh, and because those are under state and federal jurisdiction, they have their own review processes, though there are still opportunities to engage with some of these processes as we all do with the um, city level ones. So on the state level, there are general project plans or GPPs, um, and the CPC may also be referred uh, for some of these. And then on the federal level, there is NYCHA Section 18, uh, which deals with the demolition and disposition of public housing with approval by housing and urban development on the federal level. So environmental review or the SEEKER process, which stands for City Environmental Quality Review. Um, SEEKER is a comprehensive process with 19 different sections 
and is how city agencies determine what effect a discretionary action may have on the environment. Um, when figuring out if something is subject to seeker, we ask if the project needs discretionary approvals or permits from a citywide agency, if the project needs city funding, or if the project is being undertaken by a city agency. Uh, the seeker process looks at various analysis areas of envir environmental impact, including socioeconomic conditions, open space, design, infrastructure, transportation, air quality, et cetera. Uh, and it compares the no action scenario. So what would be developed on that site if the proposed action is not approved with the with action scenario, which is what would be developed if the proposed action is approved. And it looks at the reasonable worst case development scenario, meaning the maximum that could be developed under the proposal. And it looks at the increment or the difference between the no action scenario and the with action scenario. And that increment is what determines the environmental impact of a land use action. And if that impact is determined to be significant, the developer may be required to do mitigation. So a slightly newer element to the land use process is the racial impact analysis, uh, which went into effect for certain applications certified after June 2022. And this legislation and analysis applies to certain zoning map and text changes, special permits, city housing actions, site selection and acquisition, map amendments, et cetera. Um, and racial equity port reports are required for certain conditions related to the size of the project, uh, including the square footage or the number of community districts affected. Uh, and in this case, applicants are required to produce a racial equity report and the city created the Equitable Development Data Explorer tool to assist with this. Uh, it provides information on demographic conditions, household economic status, housing affordability, as well as a displacement risk map, which is shown here. And that displacement risk is based on a variety of factors, such as population vulnerability, housing conditions, and market pressure. Uh, and the racial equity report can inform discussions that are part of the Euler process. So now we're going to go into more information about ULERP or the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, and I'm going to pass it off to Madeline. Hi, everyone, and thanks, Celeste. Having a technical difficulty. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is a comprehensive list um, of all of the actions that can trigger the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure or ULERP. Um, includes rezonings, special permits, <clears throat> disposition or acquisition of city property, um, city map changes, zoning map changes, among other um, items. This is a general overview of what the ULERT process uh, looks like, and you can see where community boards um, fit in. And now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper um, into each of these different steps. So the first step in the process is for the applicant um, to get the application certified by DCP. And this will happen when DCP determines that an application is complete. Um, that'll include submission of a pre-application statement, um, finalization of actions, determination of the reasonable worst case development scenario, which Celeste just um, explained to all of us. Um, and during this time, the environmental impact statement will be drafted. Um, once that is all done, then it will be certified. <clears throat> um, a bonus is that if the proposal is found to have significant adverse impacts, um, the applicant must hold a public meeting based on a draft scope of work and publish a draft environmental impact statement and hold a hearing on that statement, which is also an opportunity for the public to weigh in on the application. So after the item, the action has been certified, um, that's when the community boards come in. Um, there are several responsibilities in this process that must take place over a period of 60 days, which include notifying the public, holding a hearing, and submitting a recommendation um, to the CPC, to our office, and to the borough board if necessary. Next, our office will enter the picture. We have 30 days um, to also deliver a recommendation to the City Planning Commission. Um, again, the borough board uh, may write a recommendation this stage if it's necessary. Um, the borough board uh, will come into the picture if an action impacts multiple um, community boards and consists of the borough president, 
uh, council members representing um, each of the community boards and the chairpersons of uh, the community boards. Then the City Planning Commission um, will host a, a hearing on the project where they'll approve, modify, or disapprove the application. At this stage, it's no longer recommendations. Um, if CPC disapproves the project, it's final. Aside from zoning map changes, special permits, um, and urban renewal plans, and the, the City Planning Commission has 60 days um, to do this. Now the City Council has the opportunity to weigh in um, based on the type of, the, of application and what others have recommended. If the City Council makes modifications, then the CPC has 15 days to uh, review those um, modifications. And if the City Council doesn't act, then the CPC uh, decision is final. The mayor also um, has can can veto the action within five days, um, but that again can actually be overturned by the city council with a two thirds majority vote, which has to happen within ten days of that. So, if an application is withdrawn, it's usually before it gets to the city council, and if the um, applicant wants to modify their proposal or pursue a development um, that. It's different in the future, then they have to start again um, from the beginning. Zoning amendments are similar to the Euler process, but it'll be simul, um, the, the community board and the borough president timelines are combined um, and happening at the same time. Um, and the uh, DCP and CPC staff has unlimited time to review. So when you're reviewing an application, a really helpful tool is the zoning application portal. Um, that includes key documents that you can evaluate when writing your recommendation. Within uh, in the zoning application portal, there, there will be a land use package, and that will include um, the project description, which has background information on the project, neighborhood context, a description of the project, and identifies the actions that are being taken. There'll also be a um, zoning map and a tax map um, and an area map. Also, there will be any environmental assessment documents um, that will also include a project description and description of existing conditions and the surrounding area and the analysis that Celeste talked about, about potential effects on the environment. This include topics um, like air quality and shadows, among others. And if it's applicable, there will also be the racial impact study in there um, for your evaluation. You can also look at the zoning resolution online. Um, so when you're reviewing the, the information that I just mentioned um, in the project description, it will outline the specific uh, changes that are being sought. Um, and so you can also review the, resol uh, the zoning resolution um, which Celeste talked about a little bit earlier. Um, there are other documents as well, um, including 197A plans. Uh, that's a section of the charter, and they can be sponsored by community boards, DCP, borough presidents, and other city entities. Um, they need to be approved by CPC and adopted by the council um, and are, you know, sort of just to guide city agencies. There are also large scale developments. Um, they can be general or residential and take place on larger zoning lots, uh, as, as well as the urban renewal law, which authorizes the city to acquire property and uh, dispose of it for redevelopment. There, it is possible um, to bring challenges to zoning changes and development um, through administrative avenues like DOB, uh, these types of challenges can include zoning challenges, um, Article 78 lawsuits, which appeal agency decisions at the state or local level, zoning text amendments, and agency directives. So LPC has the power to designate landmarks and historic districts. Um, you can make a request for evaluation, which is if you identify a site that meets the criteria for evaluation. Um, which is available online, you can download a request for evaluation form and submit it to the LPC. Um, and the LPC will look at those requests 
um, where they see there may be merit um, to advancing that. Um, the LPC will also oversee alterations to landmark properties and properties in historic districts, uh, which will have staff approval or a commission vote. And landmark properties as well and districts are granted uh, some zoning relief with um, the opportunity to transfer unused development rights. So these are some of the um, various websites and tools that might be useful to you when you're evaluating land use applications um, that we discussed today. And here's a little overview of our team. Um, you met the three of us. We also have a topographical unit. Um, and so, yeah, we're all available to you if you have any questions uh, as you're going through any of these processes. Thanks, Celeste. Um, uh, not seeing any any um, questions yet in the chat, um, and, and we'll give um, folks the opportunity to raise hands if they want to ask questions that way. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to drop in the chat here um, the contact information for um, the um, planners um, and myself um, and on the land use team, so people have that as well. Thanks, Lizette. And I know one question that came up in the chat was if these uh, if this PowerPoint or something like that could be made available afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm I'm starting to think that maybe I'm not um, I'm not seeing the quite the, there might be questions in the chat. In I'm the not Q seeing any. Yeah. Okay. In the sorry, I did tell people to use the Q and A, and here I am. Um, okay, great. Sorry. Thank you for that, Eric. Um, Yes, we we can we can share the um, share the slide deck with folks. Thank you. And then we have another question in the Q and A. I'm happy to read it out. Um, just says, how can as of right zoning be negotiated in terms of the city of yes? And they followed up by asking or mentioning if we want to be more environmentally friendly building, how do we begin to require green rooftops, setbacks every few stories to allow more air and light, solar panels, windmills, gardens, etc. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so the City of Yes is um, a series of zoning text amendments um, that uh, are proposed by the Department of City Planning um, that would bring some upgrades to our zoning resolution as, as Celeste and Madeline um, covered. Our zoning resolution is pretty, um, pretty old and 1961 is a, is a very different time um, in terms of how we try to, to regulate um, you know, uses and density in our city, um, and also what 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 existed at that time, right? And so um, there are um, three sort of major um, branches of the City of Yes initiative. The first being, um, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure I have the the question in view. Um, one is um, to deal with um, our city's carbon neutrality goals. Um, the second is to expand um, flexibility and opportunities for um, the, the small businesses in our city. Um, and the third is to spur the development of housing throughout the whole city. Um, so they, they each have um, tons and tons of um, um, proposed amendments to the zoning resolution that would um, that would facilitate, um, of course, especially for carbon neutrality. There's there's a lot there um, um, that would eliminate barriers that exist in the zoning resolution to doing things like green retrofits. Um, and so, um, I would say that that's the one that most directly will will address um, those sorts of issues. Um, I, if um if the if the person who posed the question um would just like to clarify a little bit about what they meant with um with as of right um um maybe maybe I'll try to take a, a stab of at it but um the the proposals are are um you know quite extensive and some of them would establish processes that would require a review from the city planning commission. Um, so they wouldn't be considered as of right because that is a discretionary action. So um, because there's so many different proposals, um, there are of course some elements of, of the proposal that would um, allow 
um, some of, you know, like green rooftops as of right. Um, and there are some um, parts that would propose a, a special permit or city planning commission authorization um, process for those. Um, if that if that doesn't quite answer the question, um, feel free to pose it again in, in the Q&A. Um, and I see, oh, and there you are. Um, yeah, we... Um, so, so we we will share the slide deck um, that that we presented tonight. Um, the carbon neutrality proposals are on the Department of City Planning's website. Um, uh, either if we're not able to to do it quickly in, in the chat tonight, um, we'll be happy to to send a follow up email with um, with the link to to that web page. Great. I just uh, sent the information that you were just sharing, as well as the link for uh, DCP's uh, carbon neutrality. So you guys are like the master multitaskers, man. I, I don't know how you do it. Thank you, Eric. Do it. No, no worries. Um, seems like just one more uh, question from from Zula, and then I want to get to Barbara, who raised her hand. Um, he said they said to make it more direct. How do we stop um, like sliver buildings or vertical buildings and get to setbacks? Well, um, so it, it really sort of depends on the the zoning district. Um, certain zoning districts don't have setback requirements, um, while others do. So um, there isn't like a, I think a, a citywide approach that would um, th that would uh, stop a, 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 a you know tall slender building or or any um, specific building typology for that matter. Um, as as Madeline and Celeste covered, um, we have our our zoning regulations and we have you know zoning districts mapped throughout the city. We also have a lot of special districts, and those special districts um, are established with with a wide variety of. Um, uh policy goals and other goals in mind um we have over 60 of them in the city that have been mapped and um a lot of them uh um will among other policy goals have the intent of um establishing um and or preserving a, a certain building typology um in the city you'll think of like east midtown um where where there um there is an intent there to have like taller commercial office buildings um in comparison to something like um the special garment district where you think of these big bulky big floor plate industrial buildings so um that's just to kind of illustrate how much it, it sort of runs the gamut um you know um Zoning is is a tool to um, sort of um, you know create some predictability within the the development framework as to what the building um, shape is going to be. Thank you so much, and um, Barbara, I know that you had raised your hand. I'm asking you to unmute, and you should be able to ask your question here now. Just checking one more time, Barbara, if you're there, you're able to unmute yourself. Okay, you're off mute now, but we're not able to hear you yet. Sorry, you may be having some audio issues. Uh, just going to try one more time. Sorry, we're not able to hear you. Um, if you're able to reconnect, I'm happy to have you ask your question, or if you feel like asking in the Q&A, we're also able to do that. Um, you know, I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, there we go. It's in the chat. Um, just appreciation for Lizette and their team. Um, great. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I think really what we can do now is um, if we want to wrap, just want to thank you for, for taking your time to, to illustrate the complexity and kind of this uh, mixture of different tools in the toolkit, so to speak, when it comes to zoning. 
Um, I think we're all a little more educated for it. So thank you, Lizette. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Celeste, for walking us through that. Um, I do think if anyone does have any questions, um, please, please um, always feel free to reach out to our office. Um, I know you shared uh, the slide with your contact information. So we really do truly appreciate that. Um, I think with that, I just want to make one last plug for tomorrow's training. For those um, who have not yet done it, we are really, really excited to be hosting um, with John Jay, um, at John Jay, with the, the New York State Department of Homeland Security Emergency Services um, Emergency Preparedness uh, Training. And again, you'll be able to get a really nifty uh, emergency preparedness kit with everything that you need. Um, should there be um, an event where you need a, an emergency kit? So please uh, be sure to sign up. I know Porfirio shared the information in the chat. So please, please, please sign up if you're interested. Um, with that, again, I'll just say thank you to everyone. Thank you for attendees as well. And um, this recording, if you need to take a look at it, will be available on our website next week. So with that, have a nice night. Thank you all so much again. Thank you.